This installment of this series was written by an unknown writer who used the initials WHP. He wrote a series of articles in 1859 for The Spirit of the Times, a New York publication extremely popular in those days. This particular letter was written from San Antonio, Texas. If you find this series worthwhile, please like, share, subscribe, and comment below. And do check out our website, canebreaks.com, and the offerings there. Thank you. Travels in Texas Menger House, San Antonio, July 25, 1859 In a large city with a mixed population like this, it becomes necessary for a variety of amusements to exist. And although neither the drama or companies of minstrels entertain the people, each class and each sect has its specialty, and the stranger may not want for an evening's ramble. While the lager-sucking Germans crowd the casino and scores of retail shops, the Spanish and Mexicans gather to enjoy their mate or fandango, and the still darker skins, in good old Virginia style, go in on their breakdowns. These, with billiard rooms, bowling alleys, bar rooms, and gambling houses, offer plenty of inducement for the stranger to spend both time and money, and the influx of returned Californians and Mexicans furnish plenty of food for the sharps to prey upon. I have had one bout town which gave me more insight into San Antonio life than the quiet citizen could gain in years. The Fandango I was bound to see, and with a party put out for the outskirts, and had hardly proceeded a couple of blocks before a guitar and banjo informed us we were in time. Making our way to the door, we entered a low hut where some dozen of both genders were kicking up dust in a sweltering manner. The flooring being an earthy limestone, as they shuffled away, the atmosphere became so flowery that in a short time all hands looked like millers, but not the least did it appear to molest the dancers. They cut away a series of antics consisting of a hop, skip, and jump for a full hour when the music stopped and all hands took a drink. The girls would walk around inviting the visitors to risk a few bits for luck at Monte or drop a quarter for snuff, for like their more respected white ladies, I find among them that same delectable habit of snuff-chewing, which I have noticed not only through Texas, but most of the southern cities. The music would strike up, when at it they would again start, but we were to visit others, and with an adios we put out. Our next visit was to one of much larger dimensions, and better style, to which an admission fee of four bits was demanded. Here we found some of the gayest of the gay, whose shining black eyes, pearly teeth, and flowing hair formed pictures worthy of an artist's study. It happened to be the regular Fandango night, and brilliant colored dresses trimmed with streaming ribbons added a glow to the scene unsurpassed by any fancy ball I ever witnessed. The soul-stirring music consisted of three guitars, two violins, and a curious-shaped harp, whose dulcet strains threw life into the hearts and legs of all assembled. I was witnessing a real fandango and the dancing French or waltzing Germans never in their palmiest days entered upon their favorite pastime with greater zeal than did these Mexicans. The cotillion, waltz, and polka were introduced, and the evening passed in a much more quiet way than I had expected, and although a number of Mexicans were present, they only appeared as lookers-on, leaving the lively enjoyment to the Americanos. Wine flowed freely, but no gambling was introduced, until a late hour the merriment was continued. On our return, we dropped into another house, where a Negro wedding was taking place, and where they were just in the height of a ball. Not a white face was admitted to the ball, although offers were made. Yesterday, to be in fashion after church, I visited the military plaza, where at four o'clock, from five to six hundred had assembled to witness one of those interesting scenes denominated a cockfight. The birds that were to be pitted against each other 
were introduced by two Mexicans, and their qualities descanted on. Their plumage was almost entirely plucked, and in fact they looked more as if just from battle instead of entering on it. But as their game qualities were enumerated, bets were freely made, and finding it was a one-sided affair, I laid my dollar against the favorite. Both birds wore gaffs of broadsword appearance, and being placed in attitude, pitched in. At the second strike, I had the pleasure of seeing my favorite knocked out. The gaff of his opponent having passed through his head, he keeled over and gave up the ghost. Time about three quarters of a minute and one dollar out. A second pair were soon on the field, and although bets were readily made and myself several times solicited to win back my dollar, I feared my judgment, leaving others to take the chances. The second battle lasted three minutes, both birds succumbing their lives for the amusement of the bystanders, and thus did five set-tos take place, the entertainment winding up with a fight between two Mexicans for a one-dollar bet, and concluding with both being arrested and locked up for safekeeping. This Sunday afternoon amusement, I am told, is a regular thing, and from the billiards, bowls, lager beer saloons, and bars open at all hours, one may conclude they are not a very Sabbath-observing people. A visit to the barracks afforded some amusement, and a sight at six Comanche prisoners, lately brought in by Captain King's company from the frontier. These Indians are all young men and belong to a tribe that during the past few years have committed many and serious depredations among the whites. Not satisfied to remain on the reserves appointed them, they make frequent visits to the whites, stealing cattle and horses, and in many instances committing the most atrocious murders. Although a good force of military are kept stationed on the frontier, they have been unable to quiet them till at length the depredations have become so aggravated that it has become necessary to shoot them down wherever found. The party brought in here were discovered in ambush, and there being women with them who pled for their lives to be spared, the men with one female and a boy were brought in and now await government orders. They are a brutal-looking set of fellows and bear the character of being the most treacherous tribe of any Indians. I am told there is plenty of game within a short distance of the city during the season, and that partridges and quail are killed by scores. A fair morning's work for a sportsman being from four to six dozen, or of the larger game, half a dozen head of deer. This I have not seen, however, but hear so from good authority. There are many ranches within a few miles, with thousands of sheep and cattle, which furnish large incomes to their owners. One gentleman from Australia, who has had many years' experience in sheep raising in that country, has lately established himself here with 2,000 head and pronounces it by far more advantageous for stock raising than any portion of Australia. The long cry of no crops this season has completely died out, and now all exclaim excellent crops. The rain came just in time to save the cotton and make late corn, so no fear is entertained of want. The long trains daily leaving for different parts of the country in Mexico show that business is good, and it would be an astonishing sight for some of the New Yorkers to see. A train is usually composed of 10 to 12 teams, each drawn by 16 or 20 mules or oxen, and the shouting in Spanish and the cracking of whips remind one of continental diligence drivers. I notice they have a fashion of hitching up their oxen quite unknown in the north. Instead of the common neck yoke as with us, no yoke is used, the animal being strapped around the horns and made fast to the pole. They appear to use about double the number of cattle that would be used for the same load in the north and I am told they do so because cattle are plenty. The roads to the coast are in an almost impassable condition owing to heavy rains of late. It is with the greatest difficulty stages can get through, 
passengers being compelled to walk for miles knee-deep in water. I yesterday saw a party just arrived from Lavaca who hired a team with six horses to come through with, and they reported that for 30 miles they did not see a piece of ground the size of a bed quilt, the entire distance being over a prairie covered with water. The males are all some days overdue, and it is doubtful when this will reach you, but I trust sometimes in the course of a month. This state of travel, of course, makes transportation very high, which may account for 10 cents a glass for ice water and 50 cents a pound for the pure article. Last week I received a batch of spirits by Jones's Express Company from Galveston and was highly pleased again to get posted on doings and things in general, ably given editorially and by your numerous correspondents. And long life to all is the wish of WHP. If you found this worthwhile, please share and subscribe. Your comments are appreciated, and do check out our website, canebreaks.com. Thank you.